I'm Mark Jones from Bickerstaff and um, cut me open and I love making products, designing products. And that journey started um, really from, I guess my father constantly doing DIY, which led to me repairing cars, mending cars, working on my own houses. Um, and that led me into engineering. So I did an engineering degree um, and then did a master's in industrial design engineering at the Royal College of Art. And that's really where I learnt and started really understanding what it was to design and make products. And the RCA has a very close connection to a number of companies and one of which at the time was, and still is, uh, the company Dyson that created the cyclonic, dual cyclonic vacuum cleaners and is now such a global success. Um, when I was at college, there was at least one person there, Gareth Jones, who was already doing sort of freelance work for Dyson. And he was one of my friends doing the same course at the same time. So as we went through college, occasionally James Dyson would appear and he had studied at the course earlier and he would um, give lectures about his experience and where he was. And then uh, when it came to graduation, um, Gareth Jones went back actually to work at Dyson at that time. And I went back to a job that I'd done previously, which was working at a Porsche specialist's auto farm um, whilst I was looking for a job. And then after a very few months, um, Gareth gave me a call and said, hey, we're, we've are we got more work than we can handle. Could you come down and join us? Or could you come down for interview um, with a view to joining us? Um, and so I did. I went down, I met James, saw the coach house where the uh, two or three people were working and, uh, and was lucky enough to receive a job offer several weeks later. And, uh, and that was by the start of my journey at Dyson. When I took the job, when I started at Dyson and met James, when I met James at that time, and he undoubtedly still is, a, an impressive figure, very well spoken, very well mannered, very acute in his judgment of people and the way he speaks and very incisive about his opinion, but also friendly and affable and, and open. Uh, and when I met him, I was impressed. I can remember being impressed with what he was trying to do. But at that time, the business was a consultancy with some projects. So there was no inkling of really what that business was going to become, just a bit of potential and an interesting environment to work in. So no, it really was not clear that at that time it would become the phenomenon that it is today. When I started at Dyson, um, it was a very small team. So it was literally two or three design engineers, one technician, James, um, and very shortly after I started, the first salesperson was taken on board. And at that time, I think people forget, it wasn't really a, a manufacturing company at that time, it was a consultancy. And what James had done is he had invented the technology as part of his employment at a, a bath engineering company and had taken and seen the potential of it to solve a problem in vacuum cleaning around the home. And he'd then gone and worked with some other companies, G-Force in Japan, Johnson Wax in America, and had worked with them to develop a product which they were selling. So he was selling nothing, he was selling consultancy. And so when I joined, I joined the consultancy team. And so what we did, my first job when I started at Dyson was actually to work with Johnson Wax, who are based in Canada, um, and to work with them to develop a concept for a backpack vacuum cleaner. So that's a cleaner you wear, you know, as it says, on your back, where the, it is very convenient, for instance, if you're doing commercial cleaning and you're doing a lot of cleaning, you're not having to push the vacuum cleaner, you're carrying it and you have a, a handle and you have a hose and you walk around vacuum cleaning. And so I developed up a concept for that, went out to Canada uh, with James, met the company, saw their facilities, you know, stayed in Niagara Falls, a sort of typical relationship between consultant and client. Um, and uh, that was my first job. In parallel to that, what was going on with the other members of the team was they were working on what was the first 
Dyson vacuum cleaner. They were designing, working on details, but it was still very early days. It's an interesting debate between what comes first, the, the idea, the consumer need, the intellectual property, and how that then leads into a product. And I think there's no single rule. I think all things are important and it can start from many different places. It can start from a piece of technology that you identify and transfer to another, another application. It can start from a consumer need that you then create technology to solve. Um, it's the fact that you recognize that that's what you're doing. You're bringing technology to solve a problem, to create a better solution for the, for the consumer, for the user. That's what really matters. In the case of Dyson, for instance, it was the technology transfer which was the important. James identified that you know sawmills and were using cyclonic technology to separate dust from air. And then at home, he was using vacuum cleaners and they were blocking very quickly because they had a bag and that bag would simply clog with dust. And before you knew it, it didn't work. And he was like, well, that's crazy. Ah, why don't I try using one of these cyclones to separate dust from air in a way that doesn't block because it collects in a bin at the bottom. So that was the aha moment. And that's that element of you know, what is a designer and a, what is an inventor? Invention is seeing a way of solving a problem and then working on developing the technology to make it effective. And that's what James did. So the inventive bit he did was say, I can't just take a sawmill cyclone and put it on a vacuum cleaner and it works. It didn't, it wasn't effective enough. So he had to then invent an improved cyclone, which became the dual cyclone. And that was the inventive step. So he took the starting point and then applied engineering, applied inventiveness and development to develop that technology so it worked in that application. And that was the inventive moment, was recognizing he needed to move it forward and investing the time, effort, creative sweat to actually evolve the technology and making something unique. So once you've, if you're lucky enough to come up with an idea that has a real potential and you're then looking at how you take it further um, a key part of that there's two key elements one is your personal determination your personal belief your personal resolution to to move it forward no matter what it takes you know it's a common adage that you know you have to fail a hundred times to have one success and that is undoubtedly true if you are an inventor and you are passionate about bringing it to market you will fail many times that can be a failure in the sense of trying things many times, not quite solving the problem, keeping going, keeping going, keeping going until you achieve something that works. That was the Dyson philosophy. You know, if you look at the history, there'll be all sorts of talk about thousands of prototypes. And there were, because you were trying one thing, testing it, measuring it, trying another thing, testing it, measuring it. So that's a key skill and that's a key part of being an inventor and being a successful commercial inventor. The other part is then recognizing when you need to expand your own capability to solve problems. And that can be two things. One is simply having time. You know, if you it's only you sort of trying to solve that problem, that can take a very long time. So adding people of a like-minded capability um, helps you accelerate that process and helps you also see different perspective on that. And that was what Dyson did in the early years. Most of the people that were doing the designing were very much like James. They came from the same college. He knew they had the same sort of background and probably had the same sort of mindset. And that was important for solving those initial, moving that initial idea forward. But what's important as you grow is also to recognize your own strengths and weaknesses you cannot do everything. You think you can initially, but you can't. In a small business, you start off by doing many things, wearing many hats, as you say, and that's the way to get things going. But then quickly you have to recognize where is my value? Where is the value at? Because it can be very much more effective to have someone as an expert in another discipline to do that job in half the time and allow you to concentrate on what you're good at, which can be building the business. So real importance is building a team effectively, recognizing your own strengths and weaknesses, and then allowing other people to help you overcome the obstacles and build a business. 
If I think about why Dyson has managed to become the global success that it is today, um, there's all sorts of things, uh, and you can include luck, timing, you know, all sorts of things. I think there's a there's some fundamentals. Um, I think the first was a stagnant market. So the vacuum cleaner business and the retail environment had become very stagnant. They were, everything was always the same. It was all the same technology. It might look different, be a different color, but they were all effectively the same thing. And what the Dyson technology did was break that paradigm. And it did it twofold. It did it by, in a way, selling to customers disgust. It showed customers that their houses were dirty because you could see the dirt collecting in the container at the front of the product. And that, whilst if you'd done some market research, people probably would have said, ooh, no, I don't want to see that. In reality, that was what drove its acceptance because people were using it and wanting it because it showed them that they were achieving something when they were cleaning and they were making their house cleaner. So that was a real reinforcement of what this product and technology was doing. And in the retail space, it also gave the shop floor sales staff something to sell that was different and meaningful because they got nothing to sell other than price before. And this suddenly was like, oh, look at that. Isn't it disgusting? Mm -hmm. You can see the dirt collecting in the container and it allowed that. So that was a fundamental, was really in a way ignoring sort of market research to a certain degree and having a true belief in the fundamental benefit of the idea. So that was one huge thing. The other was this determination, this ability to back yourself. And that was something that James Dyson did multiple times to get to the point that he is now. The first of those was basically saying, I will mortgage my house to raise a million pounds to buy tooling for this product before he'd actually sold those products. He had a good lead with a big retailer, but he hadn't actually yet sold or didn't have a product to sell. But he gambled and said, I'm back myself. And at some point you have to do that. And then he went on to do that again and again by saying, actually, now that money that I'm getting from selling products, I'm not gonna go off and buy my big country estate and my fast car and so on. I'm gonna pour that back into the business. And so in the early years, all of that in all of that profit was poured back into the business to help it grow. And again, that was backing himself and the self-belief that you can build a business uh, around great technology, employing people who know what they're doing. And the, the third thing, the other thing that I would say is you have to be absolutely honest and candid and give feedback directly to your team and your staff because that's the way they move forward. It's not by pussyfooting around it's softly, softly, nicely, nicely. They need to know where they are, what they've done, whether it's working or whether it's not working um, in order to move forward.